from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. I have another great show for you today, but first I'll cover just a couple of the usual housekeeping items before I get started. Don't forget, you can check out the show notes over at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find the Still Growing Podcast in the top menu and then just scroll down to episodes. Or head on over to iTunes and give me a review there. And you can also get the show at iTunes. If you happen to be listening on Stitcher Radio, hit that little thumbs up button down in the corner. I'd greatly appreciate it. All right, so a little bit about what is happening around here. Uh, This week I have some tips for hot weather gardening. You know, as it starts to heat up, my interest level in getting into the garden starts to go down. I'm not a big fan of hot weather. Probably has to do with my fair skin and uh, general fatigue, I think, with having four kids and a big dog. But uh, that said, there are some things that I've been doing lately that just seem to really help me stay in control over my garden and how I'm approaching gardening as a hobby in my life. Um, The first thing is I'm gardening in two-hour increments. I'm really trying to limit myself to maximizing my time in the garden and doing the most important things first when I'm out there. And by setting a time boundary around how long I'm going to be in the garden, it just seems like I'm able to get more done. It sounds insane. It it seems like it wouldn't work uh, as well as some of the open-ended marathons that I've uh, done in my garden in the past. But somehow having that boundary around that time um, has really helped me stay engaged in my garden this summer. The second thing is wet newspaper. I can't sing the praise of wet newspaper enough in terms of its ability to help me eradicate weeds. Um, Using it as a weed control, it has just been a revolutionary idea for me this year. I've always thought about it in the past. I guess I've just never put it into practice. But I was sitting at the farmer's market a few weeks ago with a master gardener friend, and she started singing the praises of, of wet newspaper, something very simple. And then I had the opportunity to uh, read the book by Terry Dunn Chase regarding eradicating invasives and I decided to give it a shot. And so um, I basically put together the advice in Terry's book, plus the um, advice around the newspaper, using wet newspaper, and put the two together. And I'm really coming up with a strategy that's working well for me. So I have a newspaper pile in the garage. I uh, usually put down five or six layers of newspaper over any trouble spot in my garden. And then uh, for extra um, heft, I add a little bit of mulch over the top of it. And it's working fabulously for me to help keep the weeds down. And I tell you what, it's, sometimes it's those little winds in the garden that just give you the energy to keep going. And, and I think we all need those things from time to time. And then the last thing I would tell you that's really worth working well for me is uh, all the time and effort I put into getting my drip irrigation set up, especially for my containers and my fountains. Spending that time in May and June, making sure that my drip irrigation was working correctly um, and that we weren't overwatering the plants made a huge difference in the garden this year. It's just made it much less work in general. I don't have to worry about any of my containers, and I just have to make sure that um, I check occasionally to make sure nothing's getting overwatered. But with the right emitters, you can really make container gardening especially uh, so carefree. It's fabulous. So I highly recommend those things. Today's show uh, is so exciting because we're getting a chance to talk to Shane Smith. And Shane is a pioneer in the field of gardening, especially when it comes to greenhouse gardening. And he really is a devoted plantsman when it comes to the work that he has done for the city of Cheyenne, Wyoming. 
Shane has been communicating gardening since 1978 through a regular garden radio program, and he also writes about gardening in magazines, newspapers, and books. And his books are mostly centered on greenhouses, and they are all fabulous. He is the founding director of the Cheyenne Botanic Garden Wyoming's only public botanic gardens. It is a volunteer-centered project, mostly seniors, youth, and handicapped volunteers, with an emphasis on community and sustainability. Since 1978, Shane has produced a garden-oriented radio program on KFBC AM in Cheyenne, which is the longest continually running, regularly scheduled radio program in the city. In addition, Shane regularly lectures and consults nationally and internationally on community greening, horticultural therapy, community greenhouses, and more. He is highly regarded as a pioneer of solar greenhouse technology, and he writes on his website at greenhousegarden.com. I am tickled to death to get a chance to interview Shane and I just am so thrilled to welcome you to the program today, Shane. Hi. Hi. Well, just to clarify before we get going, are you in Zone 4 or 5? We're, we're in, uh, I guess technically we're in Zone 5, but we're in a whole other world. Um, the zones don't work here. Um, Cheyenne, Wyoming, in my opinion, and I've been around, is probably one of the toughest garden climates in the lower 48. Uh, and, and let me explain why, because it's it's a number of factors that all, all make it happen. Um, number one, we are number one in the nation for hail. We average 10 to 11 hailstorms a year. Um, we are number four in the nation for wind. We average Daily average wind speed is 13 miles an hour. So if we have a calm day, we have to have a day that's 26 miles an hour all day. Um, we have the least amount of winter snow cover along the front range cities of the Rockies, which uh, means we have less snow cover than Denver or Colorado Springs, Fort Collins, Boulder, Casper, um, which makes it really hard for plants when it's windy and they don't have a blanket on top of them. And then finally, we're, we're uh, at 6,000 foot elevation. So we don't have very warm nights. We have very unpredictable spring and fall frost. We can get a frost in, in as late as June 10th or as early as uh, August 20th. Um, so, so that gives you an idea that um, you have to be kind of foolish, A, to garden here, and really foolish to uh, decide to put a botanic garden here. And in some ways, we're kind of foolish just to even have a city here. But um, that's kind of a Cheyenne tradition is to do things we're not supposed to do. So, Well, and a very determined group of people as well. Yeah, right. Right. Wow. You know, last year was a huge year for you as I was uh, looking at your website and finding out what's been written about you online. You received two national awards. First, the American Horticultural Society's Great Gardener Professional Award, and then the National Garden Club's Award of Excellence. And these awards recognize your lifetime contribution to gardening, volunteerism, education, and stewardship. You've accomplished so many things. What are you proudest of? Well, yeah, you, those are those are wonderful awards. It makes you wonder if, you're, if they're getting ready for you to kick the bucket or not. But uh, I have no plans of doing that in the near future. But one other very important thing happened last summer that um, I'm pro- probably the culmination of my 36-year career um, in gardening and, and at the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens and, and Greenhouse Gardening. And that was uh, our Botanic Garden Project, Cheyenne Botanic Garden. You can read about it at, at botanic.org. Um, we we're facing a, a dire problem in which our 100% solar heated greenhouse was falling apart after uh, 20, you know, about 26, 27 years of sort of an experimental technology. And we we're also facing the prospect that we we're going to be no longer grandfathered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we also were realizing that we needed to keep growing with the city. The city of Cheyenne has grown a lot. Um, parks have increased. We supply the flowers for the whole city park system. So um, so we realized that we were either going to pretty much go under or take a step into 
the future. So we got ourselves uh, on the ballot. Actually, we were on the, the local uh, election ballot, county ballot, a couple different times. But this last year, uh, we were on the ballot for a uh, optional sales tax, meaning a penny sales tax, uh, among other things that were on the ballot. And uh, we were proposing a $14 million expansion and renovation of our greenhouse and a $2 million operating fund for a total of $16 million. And we're in a town of, uh, of about 55 to 60,000 people and a county that's a little bit bigger than that. And uh, we were uh, on a ballot, like I said, with a lot of other issues. There was a recreation center, an airport uh, expansion, and things like that. And we're also kind of the home of people who don't like paying taxes. Um, a lot of Tea Party folks and a lot of uh, somewhat fiscally conservative people and folks were saying, you know, there's just no way people are going to go for this proposal. And my board, my volunteers, my staff, this community got out and worked and worked and worked last summer for a vote that was going to occur on last August 21st, I believe the date was. And in, in lieu of, we all hated yard signs. You know, you see yard signs everywhere during campaigns. So we came up with a wonderful alternative to the yard sign, and that was a green ribbon. And it was kind of a viral campaign. All of a sudden, green ribbons started showing up all over town. People were worried that those trees were marked with green ribbons were marked to be chopped down. And they, the whole major roadways were getting covered with supporters who tied green ribbons on them with the owner's permission. And... Um, then we let the cat out of the bag, told everybody, and uh, everybody wanted green ribbons. The whole town was just a wash in green ribbons. And the end of my long story is that I'm most proud of is the fact that this community voted in favor of that uh, tax increase to save this place, uh, provide us with $16 million, and we're going to renovate and more than double the size of our solar heated greenhouse and renovate our existing greenhouse, and we passed by 56% um, margin. And there was a rec center on the same ballot, and it didn't even pass. So, uh, and this town doesn't even have a rec center. So that gives you an idea of the wonderful support that we enjoy. And I guess that's what I'm most proud of. That's incredible. So really, the awards were just the icing on the cake because you got this fabulous thing passed in your town. Yeah, well, the awards actually came right before the vote, so I was a little nervous whether I even deserved an award or not. But, <laughs> um, but no, it was yeah, it was a, a kind of a crazy year last year, and yeah. um, but it all came out quite good thanks to not just my work at all. It was uh, just so many great volunteers, so many uh, wonderful board members, people just putting in blood, sweat, and tears to get it to pass, and it did so. Yeah. Really, what we do is really very community oriented. Um, I think most botanic gardens would say that, but I think if you saw how uh, how we're so community oriented, ninety um, percent of the physical labor that uh, we do at our garden is provided by mostly seniors, kids, and handicapped folks, along with a few normal people who don't quite fit any label. But um, yeah. it's an incredible endeavor. I know you're very passionate about your volunteers, and horticulture has a very therapeutic value as well. Yeah, I actually have a, uh, a cert- certification in horticultural therapy besides a, a degree in, in horticultural science, but um, so I, I believe gardening can heal, and, um, and everything we do is therapeutic, and we don't do make work types of projects. We work work, and we have volunteers that are planning 50,000 bedding plants in all the city parks that we have all grown together from seed in our greenhouse. And, uh, you know, it's just a major, major effort. We have a a minuscule staff of uh, basically six and a half people. And uh, we're a a seven-day-a-week operation on uh, nine acres and a 62-acre arboretum. And uh, the staff are incredible, but the volunteers really what make it happen. I love that. Shane, what aspect of your career right now is most life-giving to you? Well, I'm kind of setting the stage for the future. Um, With this election, uh, I feel like I'm leaving uh, this place. When the time comes to leave, I don't have plans to leave, but when I do, I I feel like I will be leaving it in decent shape. And... um, and with many plans into the future, you know, we've, I've always been a big believer, not always, but 
from for about 20 years now, I've been a big believer in, in planning and visioning futures and uh, started with a master plan we did in 1997 and that enabled us to really see where we were going to go. Prior to that, if somebody had an idea for a garden and had a few bucks, we just did it. A good example is we built the nation's first wheelchair accessible orchard and uh, we just did that with some old recycled runway matting from Vietnam and pruned a bunch of apple trees on some recycled timbers and strung them in an espalier fashion and and lo and behold, we had a great little horticultural therapy project that didn't hardly cost a dime. We have an incredibly uh, successful new children's garden on our grounds called the Paul Smith Children's Garden, no relation to me at all. But uh, it's a $2 million project and there's not one dime of taxpayer money in it. We privately raised every penny to build it and it's a garden that has a theme of sustainability, past, present, and future. And uh, there's all kinds of interactive fun things. I've got an incredible staff over there. We we regularly see days where we have three and four hundred people through the gates. It's uh, everything we do is free, as far as our you know gates and getting in here. And um, very creative, very fun. We hired a great designer. The community helped us design it. My staff helped us design it. And uh, and it's just. Unlike any other, I, I put it up against anybody's children's garden. It, it's as good or better than any big city, if not one of the top in the country. I'm totally biased, but I've been to an awful lot of children's gardens. And and we had a, a help from a designer, a guy by the name of Herb Shaw, who's one of the nation's top, most award-winning landscape architects in the nation. And so it's really top-notch. It, it was built in an old uh, WPA work site which was an old city park shop with incredible rock work that young men who were training to be uh, get a trade in the, in the Depression uh, built this building and this wall around our garden, and it was a city park shop for years, and we converted it, uh, gas pumps and all, which was a real headache, um, into a beautiful enclosed children's garden. So uh, that's, that's probably one of the best things we've ever done around here. What are a couple of the things that people love to come and see at that children's garden? Well, it, of course, it has uh, lots of plants. It's got, um, you know, vegetables and, and fruits, uh, you know, an orchard. But it also has uh, things where we uh, demonstrate lots of different ways to move water in sustainable ways. Uh, we've got a, uh, um, and, and when I say sustainability is the theme, it's actually sustainability is the theme past, present, and future. Because I realized early on that, that current and future sustainability is kind of boring to kids in a way. Um, a good example of that is if you think about how you we have pumped water over the years. I don't know if you've ever seen an Archimedes screw, but it looks exactly like a big screw into the water. And you crank it and water climbs up the screw. That's a lot of fun. That's third century BC uh, technology. Um, then there's hand pumps you know, that a lot of people are familiar with. You just hand pump and the water comes out and kids love operating that. And then we've got a actual well, 100 foot deep well um, with a farmer's windmill on top of it. And that's pumping water. And that's kind of fun to watch the big blades going around and a big thing going up and down in the into the uh, well head. And then right next to that is a second well head. And that's a solar powered water pump. And there's hardly any moving parts, no moving parts. It's just a big black panel and a, and a sump pump sunk way deep into the, into the um, wellhead, into the ground. So that's the most modern sustainable technology. It works great, but it's totally boring. Um, it's way more fun for kids to enjoy all the other ones, but in seeing all of them, they can kind of see the evolution and of different sustainable ways to move water. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Denver, Colorado, proper. Um, grew up in the 60s and uh, was fortunate to live near uh, Cary Creek, which is a, a creek that runs through town, and also the Highline Canal, which is a canal that, that snakes all around the in and out of uh, the edge of Denver. And so that was uh, great for me because I could go run and play in, in kind of a more rural setting. And... Uh, and then also have an urban setting as well. And then uh, I spent a lot of my summers in a family cabin down near uh, Pikes Peak and also a lot of um, time on the western slope, Grand Junction, Colorado, fruit country. I thought 
thought I was going to grow up and be a, uh, a pomologist, an orchard manager, um, because I grew up working in Denver in greenhouses. Um, there, in, in those days, there were a, Denver was a top-notch greenhouse uh, area because it had great sunlight, and so it had almost in every neighborhood there were greenhouses, little urban farms, and they were primarily growing carnations for the nation. And uh, so there were these little carnation houses. So I grew up working in those in junior high and high school, and I swore to myself I'd never work in a greenhouse again because I got pretty sick of it. And even went through my uh, degree program not really that interested in greenhouses until I started hearing about solar greenhouses and home solar food production. And then, then it all changed. Yeah, you know, I told my mom that I would never marry Philip E. Blaine, and that was in seventh grade, and look what happened. Yeah, right. Never say never. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, uh, now, was there anyone in your family that helped spark your passion for gardening? Um, somewhat. My uh, my mother always had a strawberry patch and made me weed it, and I enjoyed it, because by the time I was done, there were no weeds, but there were no strawberries. They kept coming back, so that was great. And then I had an aunt that lived over in uh, western Colorado, Grand Junction, that uh, I was very close to, and that we would always go drive around and look at the orchards, and, and that just fascinated me that you could get so much food off of trees. Um, so those two things kind of influenced me a lot. And then I was, I was growing up at a time when it was the advent of uh, the first publication of Mother Earth News and... Um, the, the, the kind of the first back to the land movement, and in, in my last year of high school, I talked a prof- uh, teacher into allowing uh, myself and a good buddy of mine to go up into the mountains west of Fort Collins, and, and we designed and built a geodesic dome, and, uh, and and we ended up living in it while we were going to college at CSU. So uh, that was kind of a again, sort of a touch on sort of sustainable architecture for us, and we sort of turned it into a little mini greenhouse, even though we didn't have running water or uh, no toilet, no no heater, no anything. Um, we had a double-seated odd house, which was nice, but um, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a rough life up there. We <laughs> were about 8,000 feet into the mountains. Wow. What are some of the ways you educate yourself in the field of gardening? Um... Well, it's really changed with the internet. Um, you know, prior to the internet, it was books, 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 and magazines. Um, now, of course, it's it's websites. But um, one of my my favorite um, things that I subscribe to, and uh, sadly they're about to go out of business, but they're they were called Hort Ideas, and it was a sort of a subscription of uh, of the latest research in horticultural science. And so uh, that's a lot of that's been a lot of fun to read. I've heard that the two people that are running it are about to uh, retire. I wish somebody would pick, pick up their um, program and take take it and run with it. And, and they would make a very interesting interview indeed because uh, they've done a great service to a lot of folks. Um, but, you know, and I still believe in magazines. I still like to get lots of garden magazines. I think they have lots of good things in them. I, I guess I'm old-fashioned. I like to read things on paper, but I do, of course, read things on on the internet. Um, I'm a garden writer, meaning I'm a member of the Garden Writer Association of America. Through that, you hear a lot of, uh, you get a lot of information about the newest products, the newest uh, things in pest control, fertilization, you know, um, gizmos, um, garden tools, lawnmowers, um, and uh, so that that's a nice way to uh, not only uh, see what's going on, but people will quite often send you books to review, and I, I review them for my radio shows and my newspaper work that I do, and and um, and so it's kind of fun to keep in touch. So if you're a garden writer, that, that's kind of a big help to, to kind of be more on the cutting edge, and um, then also I'm very active with the American Public Garden Association, and through that very large association of the, most all of the botanic gardens across the country, I've uh, developed a lot of relationships, and through that you hear about what's going on and what, what people are growing, and we've got some great gardeners uh, who do the lecture series up and down the front range of the Rockies, mostly headquartered out of Denver, but we've got some incredible folks like uh, Scott Scoverbo, who's on the forefront of a lot of 
uh, fruit tree and shrub production, Tani Odi Kelladis, who's an incredibly award-winning uh, horticulturalist who's constantly introducing new interesting perennial plants and and just an icon of, uh, of great gardening and xeriscaping. And uh, there's just lots of great folks and there's lots of lectures we can attend up and down the front range and, and we hold a lot of our own lectures, so that's that's a great way to get new information as well. How did you get into greenhouses and greenhouse gardening? Now, you mentioned the carnation experience, but was there something that kind of re-triggered it or reignited it for you? Well, yeah, I started in uh, college years reading about um, this idea of solar greenhouses. There was a fellow, uh, a couple fellows out of New Mexico that were really the true pioneers of solar greenhouses. Uh, guy by the name of uh, Jim DeCorn and another guy by the name of Bill Yonda. Uh, Bill Yonda has passed on, and I don't know what's happened to Jim DeCorn, but both. Jim DeCorn was into doing uh, trench greenhouses with combining fish and chickens, and um, and this is back in the, this is in the 70s. Um, and Bill Yonda was so passionate about the home greenhouse, home solar greenhouse, because of, why not? It heats your home. It grows food. Uh, for every square foot of solar greenhouse attached to your, that's attached on the south side of your home, you can heat two to three square feet of your home, and you get food out of it. So, um, so in uh, college, just after I, I just just about graduated and I had a number of professors offering me master's programs and I kept saying, I really don't want to do, I don't want to really study sugar content of potato chips and become a potato chip guy the rest of my life. Um, I, and I said, do you have anything I could do in, in home food production and greenhouses? And they're like, are you crazy? First of all, that doesn't work. And second of all, nobody's going to fund it. And, um, I was living in Fort Collins at the time and I happened to, uh, stumble upon uh, the fact that people were doing a um, greenhouse up in Cheyenne, which was 40 miles from where I live. So I drove up and started volunteering in my spare time. Turns out they were building, uh, doing the final stages of constructing, at that time, the world's largest solar heated greenhouse. It was a 5,000 square foot solar heated greenhouse. And um, they were doing it as kind of a low income solar senior, uh, senior center kind of project. And uh, so I plugged into them and started helping them finish the construction. And, and when they were done, uh, they needed somebody who knew something about operating a greenhouse. And, and um, I was in. And I, it was just kind of continuing on the passion of I wasn't so much in a, into greenhouses for the commercial side, but more for uh, kind of the food side. And then I found out it became a great vehicle for social change. And... Uh, I, I hooked up again um, not too long after we I started in Cheyenne with Bill Yonda, and he had organized sort of a barn raising from state to state where we would build 30 or 40 solar heated greenhouses in each of the Rocky Mountain states. And, uh, and so I would leave my job in Cheyenne and go off and help Bill, and we would design and build greenhouses in a weekend and uh, started spreading the word. And I know people would see those, and they would build their greenhouses and it was just kind of uh, planting the seed everywhere um, and then our greenhouse here evolved uh, you know we started we had no idea quite how it was going to operate it became it started off as kind of semi-commercial we sold bedding plants and trees and shrubs and we started building uh, I have a nice little design for a, a geodesic dome we could build out of a quarter inch plywood three or four sheets of plywood and then we just cover it with polyethylene and it was great for our high wind areas and we started doing spreading commercial production out into those domes and cold frames and and uh, we were there for nine years at our original site and during those nine years we expanded into working with senior citizens kids handicapped folks the community we started the the state of wyoming's first modern day farmers market we started the first modern day community garden first one since the victory gardens of world war ii and um and taught a lot of other communities across Wyoming how to do both of those things, farmers markets and community gardens. And we kept thinking the world was going to really get excited about solar greenhouses and solar energy and free heat and easy to grow food. And, and they really didn't. Um, you know, through the 70s and 80s and even early 90s, we just kind of bungled along and, and did our thing. People come by and say, why are you messing with that solar? Why don't you run the temperatures up? You can grow plants a little quicker. And 
energy's not that expensive. And we're like, because we don't want it. We like being solar. It's simple. It's easy. And um, and our place started falling apart. Uh, the greenhouse, sort of, sort of a familiar story, in uh, 80, oh, it was about 85, and we were about to just go under. And uh, and what last little funding we had was about to be cut because the mayor was going to give our funds to um, the downtown association. And the downtown association found out we were getting cut, and they, they didn't want that money. They didn't want to see us go under. And so the mayor kind of backtracked on that and said, I'll help you guys out. What are you doing out there? He'd never seen it. Came out and went, wow, it's like a whole farm. And, and in those days, we actually had chickens, geese, turkeys, community gardens, wheelchair orchards, adobe ovens, um, dome season extenders, uh, a small store where we sold plants and seeds. And, and, um, and we said, well, you know, we're, we're just so fragile. We're about to go under unless we become more institutionalized. And we formed a committee to look into how we could be institutionalized. We became part of the, uh, long story short, we became part of the city parks uh, uh, division and uh, found a grant, a very large grant to build our new greenhouse in a city park in 1986. Built a new solar greenhouse, the one we're in now. We've been there ever since, and now we're about to renovate this greenhouse and expand. So that's full circle. Now, greenhouses have existed since Roman times, and historically, greenhouses were really only used by universities, the wealthy, or people of nobility. Do you remember the first greenhouse that made a powerful impression on you? You know, it probably was, uh, you know, the things Bill Yond and Jim DeCorn were doing were quite interesting to me. But one of the more, a few years after we started the uh, Cheyenne Botanic Gardens, in our early days, it was called the Cheyenne Community Solar Greenhouse. But I had a, um, a volunteer for me uh, who was a senior citizen. He was in his 80s. His name was Isidore Lopez. And it turned out he was my next door neighbor as well because I lived in a uh, garage because that's all I could afford. We didn't get paid very much, still don't. But um, I lived in a garage on the south side of town and he lived next door. You know, the garage was converted into a little apartment. It was pretty funky. But uh, he, he found out what we were doing and started volunteering out there. Plus Isidore, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> For people interested in seeing some of the best greenhouses in the United States, what greenhouses would make your top five must see? Oh boy, that's a hard, hard one. You know, I you see so many neat little home custom jobs, um, and it depends if you're talking 
botanic garden, commercial, or or uh, backyard, and it's hard to even even break those apart. You know, there's some neat old famous ones. You know, the Climatron at at, at the uh, St. Louis Botanic Garden is one of the first big geodesic greenhouses. It's pretty impressive. Um, you know, botanic gardens all across the country are doing interesting new creative things. Our new uh, renovated or our new expanded greenhouse is going to have some very interesting heating where we're sinking um, radiators in a nearby lake, and we're going to be extracting heat off the lake temperature and using that energy from the lake to um, heat and cool our new greenhouse. But but picking one greenhouse in particular, boy, you just see some really neat creative ones around there. It's hard to hard to pick anyone out. It, you know, it was kind of fun to watch the whole biodome. Uh, greenhouse go through its things and it ended up actually becoming a, a comedy movie but uh, it really was an interesting question I think to say let's look at planet earth let's look at the greenhouse as a metaphor for our planet what if that was all we had we couldn't just be spewing pollutants in there if that's our only air and we couldn't be polluting our water if that's our only water and the premise that of the biodome was that you know nothing comes in nothing leaves you guys are in there make your own oxygen grow your own food lots of luck now it had lots of problems but i think it made a pretty interesting premise and an interesting statement and got people to think a little bit about our planet in a different way so even though I think overall it really didn't survive as a great experiment for a variety of reasons unrelated, I think, to the technology or maybe our understanding of, of the technology. I mean, they didn't realize that that concrete in and of itself would have an impact on the atmosphere in that space. But, you know, kind of some fascinating stuff. Yeah, a worthwhile experiment. Yeah. Now, the French botanist Charles Lucien Bonaparte built the first modern greenhouse in Holland during the 1800s to grow medicinal tropical plants. And the French used to call their first greenhouses orangeries since they used to use them to protect their orange trees from freezing. What are some of the innovations that are transforming the way greenhouses are designed today? You mentioned the radiators in the lake. Is there anything else that's really cutting edge that's caught your eye recently? Well, we're seeing um, we're seeing our plastics continue to evolve. Uh, polycarbonates used to be started off a single layer thick, and then they went to a double sort of honeycomb, then triple. Now we're up to five layers thick, which is pretty amazing. If you live in a sunny climate, it works quite well. Um, or you know, in one of my very first books, I proposed a crazy sort of science fiction idea. I'm I'm a science fiction fan. And I'm always like trying to think about the future. And I had proposed an idea that maybe someday we would be growing algae in our water tubes that are, that hold our heat, and the algae would provide supplemental lighting because it would glow in the dark. And lo and behold, I'm reading just in the past uh, few months about people developing glow in the dark algae. And uh, who knows, you know, where that's going to go? But I think we're going to see um, we're going to see greenhouses uh, continue to evolve. I think we're going to see plastic that last longer in the sun, that's the big drawback with greenhouses, is so many of us have to use plastics for price or because they're the strongest material against hail. But plastics have a lot of problems. We're gonna have to, we need to really learn how to recycle polycarbonates, make sure they're not outgassing uh, toxic materials, make sure that they last a lot longer. And also glass technology is really, uh, really changing. And I, I see um, where we already have some photovoltaic embedded glass that lets both light and creates electricity at the same time. Huh. That's probably going to evolve even more where we'll just be uh, having outlets coming off of our greenhouse glazing and creating electricity as well as other things like food and flowers. So uh, it's it's an interesting future. I don't think it's evolving quite as fast as uh, as our computer chips are, but it's still pretty interesting. Now, uh, you mentioned withstanding hail, and of course, as a Minnesota girl growing up on the prairie, I know how bad the weather can be up here, and and you talked about Cheyenne at the beginning of the show. How do these things withstand the elements, and do you have to do some maintenance when storms go through? I mean, can they hold up to severe weather? Well, I mean, there's... There's weather that can take any greenhouse out, as we saw in the, in the recent uh, hurricanes that have hit hit uh, New York and New Jersey and those areas. But uh, but yeah, greenhouses um, they need maintenance. They need uh, 
looking after, and they age. You know, like you say, right now most of our greenhouse glazings that are not glass don't last much past uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, some people are starting to look at, at some cutting edge technology that where they're starting to look at maybe getting close to 20 years. Um, but anything in the sun that's plastic gets taken apart by the sun. That's just the nature of the ultraviolet light and, and its effects. So, um, so you're at some point you have to replace glazings, um, or reapply uh, treatments on them. Some of them that you can paint a material over the top regularly and that gives them a little longer life. Glass, of course, lasts forever, but glass is a little harder to work with. Um, but glass is very susceptible to hail and rocks and things like that. So even with the best glass greenhouse, you're probably gonna have to replace it once in a while. Um, insulated glass sometimes loses its seal and starts getting uh, growing stuff in between the, the layers, growing algae and condensation and such. So there's that. But the one thing um, I think is important, especially for, for people with solar greenhouses, is with a solar greenhouse, you really start thinking long and hard about how tight is it, especially when winter's coming in October, and you start yes. feeling little cold leaks here and there. And so as a regular maintenance thing, you pretty much um, need to go through and check your weather strip, check your seals on your windows, cover your fans up if need be. But even with solar greenhouse, even in somewhat cloudy climates, and, and greenhouse, solar greenhouses do work in cloudy climates. I've seen them in the cloudiest of climates. Um, I've seen them in upstate Vermont. I've seen them all around Alaska. Um, uh, it's uh, pretty amazing. In fact, there's probably more greenhouses per capita in Alaska than any place I've ever been. But, uh, but sometimes you need to t be able to, even on a sunny winter day, you could overheat and you might need to open a vent and then close it because it's gonna get below zero that night. Um, especially here in the high plains, we can get wide temperature fluctuations. So you need to be able to, to easily do that kind of opening and closing of, of, uh, of vents and make sure everything seals up. So there's that kind of structural maintenance. So you need to kind of temper your lust for a greenhouse with the fact that these things require some pretty regular maintenance and attention, right? Yeah, but it's not it's not overwhelming, and it's um, I mean, yeah, it, when the time comes after you've enjoyed your greenhouse for twelve years and you've got to replace all your polycarbonate, yeah, that's kind of a big headache and, and an expense. Um, but it, as far as year to year, you don't spend a whole lot of time on on maintaining the greenhouse. I read in a recent Wall Street Journal article that greenhouses are the new woman cave, the female version of the man cave, and they're becoming a place for crafting, reading, lounging, and entertaining. Are you noticing this too? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot more of that. I, I kind of think of my greenhouse as a man cave too, but my, my wife likes hanging down there too. But um, no, I think more and more women, um, I, you know, the good, I was talking about how gardening was sort of not solar energy was not all that popular in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And the same was true with gardening. Um, kids weren't majoring in it. People weren't inter interested in it. Now things have changed and people are very interested in solar. People are very interested in energy and, and the, there's a revolution in how we grow and eat our food at the same time when we really need a revolution because we're, we're getting worried about um, weird bacteria in our in our food and um, pesticides and GMOs and, and what's the solution to that? Well, grow your own. You don't have to be rich to do it. Um, and you know, like I said earlier, you don't even have to be rich to have a greenhouse if you're creative. But I think... Um, more and more people are enjoying gardening so much and uh, that they're saying, well, God, let's do this year round. And uh, it really does create a nice quality of life. And, uh, and also greenhouses are, are a nice place to hang out. I often uh, say there's such a thing as a good greenhouse effect. You know, greenhouse effect always gets a bad connotation, but um, they're just stealing, stealing the word greenhouse. A, a real greenhouse people love to hang out in. Um, it feels tropical, and I think that's where humanity came from. And that that warmth and that humidity on a cold winter day is so nourishing. And the fact that you're, you know, yeah, it's February, but you're picking your own salad and you've got a bouquet on the table that both came from your greenhouse, and you're, you have absolutely no worries about where that salad came from. And it tastes great. And, uh, you know, that's I think that's the attraction 
to a lot of women and men both that, you know, the, these are kind of fun things to have and desirable. And we're seeing that, uh, we're not really seeing a drop in sales of greenhouse kits. We're seeing an increase and increase across America. That's great. You know, in 1982, you wrote The Frost-Free Greenhouse for the Department of Energy. It was the first book written on the subject of farming with unheated greenhouse-like high tunnels using the only the design of the structure and solar heat to prevent frost. What impact did that guide have on the gardening community? Almost nothing. <laughs> um which is which is sad. I mean, DOE was was uh, it was sort of a subgroup to DOE called Western Sun, and they were very far thinking. And and I had come up with this idea that you know we can apply the same things in these that we're applying in these home solar greenhouses and the same technique we did in the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens large solar greenhouse to a Quonset type high tunnel, and uh, made the proposal and and did the book and did some workshops for Department of Energy back in the early 80s. And uh, I thought it was just a great idea. And I even talked to some commercial growers about it and they just thought it was it was just too foreign. It's like a greenhouse without heat, why would you do that? And uh, you can't grow as much, of course, with cooler temperatures, but you're saving a ton on your heating bill. So the bottom line is so good. And uh, yeah, I wish I had kept that book going and evolved it and uh, and then I could have beat Elliot Coleman to the punch who's been wonderfully successful with his books and has done a great job with it but uh, no my book had pretty much uh, no impact <laughs> so huh. um, I'm, I'm glad that my uh, that my basic greenhouse book Greenhouse Gardener's Companion has been very um, popular and, and the sales have been very steady on that and we're fortunate with that um, but uh, I think the idea of high tunnels is a great thing. It's really taking off. People are, uh, state act departments across the nation are offering subsidies now for that idea, um, allowing people to build their own, and it's creating whole new markets um, in uh, agriculture and climates where before that they couldn't really do it, anything, uh, couldn't really be growing commercially. And uh, so I, I think uh, high tunnels and season extenders are just, just great. I'm glad I had a little hand in it early on. Maybe, maybe somebody saw what I wrote, but uh, it's not out there. So. It's not always easy being the pioneer, is it? Yeah, right. You think you have a good idea, and you tell everybody it's a good idea, and you wait 10 years and nothing happens. So, oh well. Yeah, but in the end, it sounds like you're getting a lot of validation for it. Well, yeah, yeah, and that makes me feel really good. Yeah, that is good. Now, you mentioned your, your other book that you wrote in 1982, The Greenhouse Gardener's Companion. That was really a book designed for, you know, regular gardeners, regular homeowners. And it is, a, you know, and it is a top-selling greenhouse book for home hobbyists. It was first released in 1982, and it's now on its third edition. Can you believe it's been over 30 years since it was first published? And what inspired you to write this book? Well, I, I, it, it actually, there was a book between those two books. Uh, there was a book called The Solar, oh, I might not get this exactly right, The Solar Food, or no, it was called The um, the Bountiful Solar Greenhouse. And I published that with a company out of New Mexico, and it did reasonably well. And what I'd realized that in our early days of the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens, we were gardening without heat, and there was no book on that. It was all. It was an agricultural environment that had never been dealt with. Nobody had ever really done much experimentation with it, and so we had learned how to develop what schedules, what plants, what varieties, placement um, techniques. Um, it, you know, everything from pollination to pest control is different, and so I, that was what my first book was about. Was really only for solar greenhouses. It's it's no longer out on the market, and. Um, and so it went out of print, and I was approached by uh, Fulcrum Publications to kind of take that book and expand it. And I was glad to do it. Uh, at first, I was a little weary, um, but I, I went ahead and did it, and I was really busy in my life, but uh, worked many, many long nights to get it all done, and, and then, uh, then came back at it and did another revision. Um, to the current version we have now, which is kind of getting old, but really an awful lot of it is still quite valid, and uh, apparently people are still finding good value in it, so that's great, and that's the, uh, the Greenhouse Gardener's Companion. 
one of your book review reviews referred to you as the vanguard of user-friendly greenhouse design. What are some of the key elements that make a greenhouse user-friendly? Well, um, I think simplicity is, is real important. I find that, that the more people automate their home greenhouses especially, the more trouble they get in. Um, and the idea of a passive solar heated greenhouse is very simplistic, you know, there's hardly any or virtually no moving parts as, in, as far as heating. Um, so that's simple, you know, and just uh, using white beds, knowing how to lay those white beds out so it's a little easier to get around and, and move. And, and uh, just also a lot of it is in, is in the technique of the horticulture in a greenhouse. It's, it's not hard, it's just different. And uh, you have to learn to become good at observing and not just bringing your outdoor ways into the indoors and think that they're going to work. Um, there's a lot of rules that change inside, and uh, they're really easy rules and real simple rules, uh, but it really helps to be observant. Obviously, greenhouses are beneficial for folks who live in cold climates because you can extend your growing season, but what are some of the other ways that greenhouses are beneficial? Well, um, you know, I'm seeing not just in cold climates, we're getting a lot of interest over the years in people down in the southern states. Uh, they find that, you know, they can. it's getting so hot, especially with global warming, that they, they can't grow their tomatoes in the summertime. Um, and so they kind of have to sneak the tomatoes out on the shoulder seasons of spring and fall. And they're, they're finding quite often that a greenhouse in the winter enables them to have a three-season garden instead of a two-season garden. And so even in the south, we're seeing some interest in, in greenhouses. Um, and then there's a, what we call screenhouses. I've been working on and off with a, an orphanage down in Venezuela um, where they have a large uh, hydroponic greenhouse. It's, uh, it's just screens, but it's really pretty much operated like a greenhouse because it's in the tropics. And it's a greenhouse frame and, and uh, works quite well. Now, in your book, Greenhouse Gardener's Companion, you explain to folks that greenhouse gardening is not hard, it's just different. What can folks expect by way of changes to their standard gardening techniques or approaches should they decide to get into greenhouse gardening? Well, number one, you think you have to think about um, a whole new crop of pests. The pests in, that are out in your yard are quite often not always, but quite often different than the pests you have in your greenhouse. And uh, so you might have to deal with, with a whole new cast of characters. Um, watering is totally different, especially in the winter greenhouse. Um, the uh, winter greenhouse is very, very water efficient because it's so humid. You just don't need to water that much. And I see a lot of people have problems with overwatering, especially those folks who live in drier climates and they're used to their outside garden needing water, you know, Two, three, four times a week, and then they come into the green or into the greenhouse from the outdoors, and they start doing two, three, four times a week, and everything is drowning. So uh, that's something that that's different. Um, being in an enclosed environment, getting back to pest control, being in an enclosed environment, it allows you to have a lot more possibilities with biological pest controls. You know, you can release a ladybug out your garden, and it's going to blow away on the next wind. But you release a ladybug in your greenhouse, and it's going to hang out there a while. There's actually a lot better uh, beneficial insects and ladybugs, which I go into at length in my book. Um, so there's that. There's sort of three different things you can grow. Well, maybe four different things you can grow in your greenhouse that you kind of have to think about and make decisions on. You can grow veggies, you know, lettuce and you know leafy crops and fruit crops and root crops that all end up in your belly. You can grow uh, things for your heart, like flowers, um, and even some flowers that can end up in your belly, but you can uh, grow a number of wonderful cut flowers, uh, winter and summer. Um, there's tropical plants, so it opens up a whole new realm of, of gardening that a lot of people are used to. You know, why not grow oranges, turn your little greenhouse, in, or at least a corner in, into an orangery so you can grow your own blood oranges that have a nice sweet red flesh or you can grow your own pineapple guavas which are have both edible flowers and wonderfully edible fruit um you know there's just lots of fun 
tropical plants, both ornamental and edible. Uh, bananas, although you have to be very careful about uh, what bananas you grow, because even a dwarf banana will get 20 feet high. Um, so you have to grow the super dwarfs in most greenhouses, unless you have a two or three story greenhouse. Um, and, and then you can also get into, and I should say all of those things that I just talked about require pretty decent light. Um, those people that have a somewhat of a shady greenhouse, I feel bad for them because it really limits what you can do, but in a shady greenhouse now you're into more of the house plant realm where you're growing all the plants that can tolerate low light, but you're not going to get much food or, or uh, flowers or even tropical food or tropical plants um, with a few exceptions. Uh, but I'm looking out right now, speaking of tropical, we've got a, a coffee plant that's getting full of red coffee beans, uh, coffee fruits, I should say, and inside the red fruits are coffee beans. So, um, you know, you might even be able to, you're not going to get a ton of harvest off coffee, but you're going to get a cup here or there. It's kind of fun. That does sound like fun. So you mentioned veggies, flowers, and tropical. What's the fourth? The fourth would be more the houseplant realm. In a shady greenhouse, all you can really grow are kind of the more traditional house plants. So yeah, it's green, it's pretty, it's ferns, it's um, and a lot of the house plants are tropicals, but they're low light tropicals, so they're not going to be big flowers, they're not going to be fruiting. Um, but uh, you know, that's that's about the only option you have if you end up with a low light greenhouse. This concludes part one of my interview with Shane Smith, the director of the Cheyenne Botanic Garden, Wyoming's only public botanic garden. Shane is also the author of Greenhouse Gardener's Companion, and he also has his website at greenhousegarden.com. I want to thank Shane for being on the show with me today. I'll have part two of the interview available next week, so look for that. I'll have all of the information from the show today at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And you can find this episode in the top menu under the Still Growing Podcast. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Episodes and production notes can be found at sixfootmama.com in the top menu under Still Growing Podcast. Of course, you can always find me at sixfootmama.com or on facebook.com backslash still growing with sixfootmama. You can also email me directly at jennifer at sixfootmama.com. Feel free to send in your questions for the Master Gardener Round table, which airs every other month on Still Growing. Your question will be answered either via email or during the podcast. Once again, Still Growing is an hour-long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Okay, so I'm joined by Emma, my daughter, who just had a birthday and she just turned 12 two days ago. Hi, Emma. Hi, Mom. And Emma's here um, in honor of the fact that I interviewed Shane Smith. We thought it would be appropriate to read some poetry about greenhouses. And in doing our research about it, we learned about the poet Theodore Retke. The University of Washington has done a nice job on their website of featuring the poet Theodore Retke and talking about his life. They also indicate that he is considered perhaps the greatest American poet of his generation. He served on the University of Washington faculty from 1947 until his death in 1963. As mentioned on the website, Retke's best-known works are poems that incorporate memories from his childhood, specifically of his father's greenhouse, and these are considered by many to be his greatest achievement. In 1948, Retke published a book called The Lost Son, and those poems include Child on Top of a Greenhouse, Orchids, and A Field of Light, and these are the poems that Emma is going to read for us today. Child on top of a greenhouse. The wind billowing out of the seat of my bridges. My feet crackling splinters of glass and dried putty. The half-grown chrysanthemums. Chrysanthemums staring up like accusers. Up through the streaked glass, 
flashing with sunlight. A few white clouds, all rushing eastward, a line of elms, plunging and tossing like horses, and everyone, everyone, pointing up and shouting. That's right. And why do you think they're pointing up and shouting? Because he's about to fall out, like he's going to fall through the glass. He's on the greenhouse. He's sitting on top. And that's why everybody's like, oh my gosh, he's sitting on top of glass. He's going to fall and break the greenhouse. That's why everyone is going, no, he's sitting on top. And the only thing holding him up is a sheet of glass and the putty in the corners of the glass. He's about to fall through the greenhouse. Okay, ready? I don't know. It's a poem. Do you think that was a good idea? No. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So the next one you're going to read is called Orchids. Are you ready? Orchids. They lean over the path. Adder mouth. I've never heard of that. Adder mouth, like a snake. Adder, okay. Orchids. They lean over the path. Adder mouth. Swaying close to the face, coming out, soft and deceptive, limp and damp, delicate as a young bird's tongue. Their fluttery, fledgling lips move slowly, drawing in the warm air. And at night, the faint moon falling through the whitewashed glass, the heat going down. So their musky smell comes even stronger. Drifting down from the mossy cradles, so many devouring infants, soft luminescent fingers, lips neither dead or nor alive, loose ghostly mouths, breathing. The final poem Emma's going to read today is called A Field of Light. And on the website, there's a quote from Jay Perini, who is the author of Theodore Redke in American Romantic. And about this poem, he says that one finds in a passage like this what poets call an ear. Each line unfolds into its perfect organic shape as if no other form were possible. The rhythm grows out of itself, much as a tree's leaf and bud unfold from a common root, trunk, and branch. One has to go back to Walt Whitman, writing a century before, to find such perfection in the free verse line. And here's Emma reading a passage from A Field of Light. From A Field of Light Listen, love. The fat lark sang in the field. I touched the ground, the ground warmed by my, the killdeer. The salt laughed in the stones. The ferns had their ways in the pulsing lizards. And the new plants, still awkward in their soil, the lovely diminutives. I could watch, I could watch. I saw the separateness of all things. My heart lifted up with the great grasses. The weeds believed me, and the nesting birds. There were clouds making a rout of shapes crossing a windbreak of cedars, and a bee shaking drops from a rain-soaked honeysuckle. The worms were delighted as wrens. And I walked, I walked through the light air, I moved with the morning. Thank you, Emma. Is it time for movie night? Yeah. Okay.